Hey guys, welcome back. So today I'll be talking about combat. One way that makes games so strange as an art form is the sheer overwhelming amount of ways that they can be built and approached, especially as a designer. Like one of the hardest parts of game design is how you're even going to approach the project. There's art and music, the mechanics, there's so many things to consider. Like every game is so unique. I'm 27 years old and I started playing games when I was around 7 years old with my first game being Crash Bandicoot 2 on the PlayStation 1. And since then, after 20 years of playing games, every game really expands my conception of what games can even be. But I'll just start talking about the mechanics for Shivering Hearts. So in software design and game design, there's the concept of having a minimum viable product. What is the bare minimum of what you want to achieve for your game to consider it complete enough to be shipped out? Approaching game dev this way is so much safer, rather than trying to incorporate everything in one go, especially if you're working by yourself or are in a small team, because you can really keep adding layers of mechanics later on to further flesh out the experience. So that was a lot more important for me, to slowly achieve these measurable goals over a period of time to really see meaningful growth in the project. Now I'll talk about mechanics more broadly in a holistic sense. So you're usually taught to think of designing mechanics by thinking about mechanics as verbs or actions. Walking, jumping, attacking, talking. Super Mario Brothers, for example, you know, you use a complex set of equations to simulate the act of jumping, have it respond to an input, like a button on a controller. Then you design obstacles and the world at large around this central mechanic. Now, it might be a bit unfair for me to compare a game from 1983, but my favourite games aren't usually like this, to me at least. My favourite games usually start with a world or a mood, uh, a theme. Strong conceptual work like concept art or writing at the core of it, and then the mechanics and how you interact with that world branch off from this core. The mechanics might not feel super refined or feel pleasing to play, or they might feel quite obtuse, but I think the final game is much more interesting as a result. One example I would love to show is one of my favourite games of all time, Silent Hill 2. I feel everything in this game far surpasses almost every other game ever made, but many players, even fans of horror games, dismiss the game or feel the camera and the controls are too bothersome for them to deal with. But what the game lacks in good game feel or controls, it makes up for as a genuinely masterful exploration of human emotion and fear through its emotionally and spiritually broken characters and its genuinely oppressive atmosphere. You feel you're descending deeper into the abyss where there is no hope of redemption and that's a great feeling. <laughs> Another great example I want to show is Morrowind. I think it's the strongest Bethesda game personally, especially in terms of world design, but a lot of people can't get past certain mechanics like how unintuitive the combat feels compared to modern Bethesda games and how much you miss in that game because it simulates dice rolls or how the conversation system works in that game by having you select topics rather than a traditional dialogue tree. That's enough of a barrier for most people to stop playing. But again, while it lacks controls that feel good in your hands and a great amount of mechanics that aren't as streamlined as Oblivion or Skyrim, it makes up for it with its great mechanical depth and its intensely rich setting and narrative. Everyone likes to make fun of Todd Howard, but I think his original excerpt from the Morrowind art book is really enlightening. He says, In January of 1997, four artists locked themselves in a room to lay the foundation for the third chapter in the Elder Scrolls series. Knowing that the game would be set in the dark and exotic land of Morrowind, they set out to discover what a Dark Elf would look like. The initial Dark Elf look emerged over the next month, and the project was put on hold due to its massive scope. In January of 1999, the staff once again met in this room, which had become known as the War Room. This was the place where the entire team would meet through the year to discuss what the game was going to be, how it was going to play, and what it would look like. The walls slowly filled with exotic imagery of the land of Morrowind, its peoples and places. We strove to create another world that would come alive on the screen, another world for you to live and lose yourself in. Two whole years of pre-production and concept work to figure out what Morrowind even is. 
It's an incredibly engaging setting where the many factions, races, and powerful individuals at play all have motivations and justifications in how they want to shape the land of Morrowind based on how they interpret historical events and the wider politics of the land, and the player is dropped right in there and have to decide who to trust, who really has your best interests at heart, and how you can change the land of Morrowind by righting past wrongs and injustices, or whether you are okay in perpetuating an unjust status quo, rife with racial and social inequity and xenophobia, if you feel that it's still for the greater good for the land of Morrowind. That's damn beautiful. Lastly, I want to show this classic here, Demon's Souls. I love it dearly. <laughs> this is my favourite game in the Souls series, even though it's incredibly hard for me to decide between all of them. They are all incredible in their own way. But a lot of people, even Bloodborne or Dark Souls fans, simply don't understand Demon's Souls and what the designers were trying to achieve. There are quite a few unintuitive or frustrating things about Demon's Souls, like how dark the worlds are and how it genuinely feels more like a horror game than Bloodborne as you stumble through the dark filled with horrors that are trying to kill you and the only source of light is the glowing rock on your hip or how clunky the combat feels compared to later games in the series, or the world tendency mechanic which changes the world depending on how many times you died or how many bosses you've defeated. But I feel that even though the mechanical depth and the feel for the controls in combat are way more refined in the later entries, the visual design and the atmosphere of the world has yet to be topped in Demon's Souls. The game weaves a beautifully haunting tale of humanity's corruption through its world design and shows how this corruption took place long before the arrival of the demons. To me, the game illustrates so well that humanity never had an original state of purity, which was later corrupted by an outside force like the biblical Adam and Eve story. Rather, humanity was born depraved, sickly, and capable of great evil and that it's delusional to think that humanity is worth any form of redemption. The director of the Soul series, Hidetaka Miyazaki, said in an interview, counting from the earliest stage of development, materializing the visions I had in my mind for each world, it took a little over two years to create. After I had firm visions of the setting inside my head, I'd say it took about a year to go from detailed artwork and level design work to the final product. I think those years of concepting before development was really important, and it gave the team time to let ideas ferment in their heads, and it really carries through to the thematic richness of each world's design and the staggering amount of detail put into each world. These games, I feel, are the pinnacle of game design. They all have great depth to the mechanics and their world design, and they all intertwine together into a glorious soup that all contributes to the game's atmosphere, themes, and experience. I've discussed before in the previous developer diary that even though conversation trees allow me to tell a story and have a conclusive experience, while also trying my best to allow for player involvement in the story, there are limitations to solely relying on just one mechanic. So where could I go next? Let's start with combat. So I've been playing through a game called Suikoden 2 that came out in 1998 on the PlayStation 1, and there are so many great aspects and design decisions this game has that I would really love to bring over to Shivering Hearts. It'll really give Shivering Hearts more bite and depth on a mechanical level, especially the combat, as I feel this would bring a very important layer of variety to the gameplay. Combat in Suikoden 2 is divided into two distinct modes, there's the more traditional turn-based combat system, where you control a whole party, but an incredibly well done iteration of the concept, and I've barely seen any other games that allow for six characters to be in combat at the same time. The selling point for the Suikoden games is that you can recruit over 100 possible party members, although in reality the number is more like 72, but that's still an insane amount of party members and you can create a limitless amount of party compositions from this. The other important side to combat are the one-on-one -on -one duels you have at certain parts of the story. I think this is really cool, like super cool, 
I've been prototyping a combat system very similar to this. The core concept is based on rock, paper, scissors, where each combatant has three options, attack, defend, and wild attack. Attack beats defend, defend beats wild attack, and wild attack beats attack. The important layer to this is that the opponent would then use dialogue cues before their move, and you would have to predict and interpret what action they take. This adds a level of strategy and mind games to the combat, where you have to accurately read the tells of your opponent, compared to normal rock paper scissors which is pretty much down to chance, I think. Now I can't take credit for designing or programming the system, I'm using a plugin developed by an incredible person called T-Wings, or Twings, and I would love to create slick combat animations and see if I can push this and create something really fun and hype. From this early prototype, it's already pretty fun, and with practice, you can reliably do no-hit runs against opponents. I think this is a really cool way to do turn-based combat. It's very simple, yet very satisfying when you read your opponent correctly, and I can fine-tune how difficult I want each encounter to be. There's also a lot more of a back-and-forth exchange compared to usual turn-based JRPG combat, which usually involves learning elemental weaknesses and status effects like Pokemon or Final Fantasy or the Shin Megami Tensei series, which you know is still a very solid form of gameplay. I see some people complain about the system, stating that it boils down to memorizing a spreadsheet of elemental weaknesses, and I see where they're coming from, but I don't think that's very fair to those games. Each system that each game brings has its own level of strategy and nuances. However, there's just one slight problem with Suikoden 2. It's just a bit too easy, especially these duels which are one of the most unique things about the combat. Fights usually last only for a couple of minutes, and even the really juicy fights can still be steamrolled through. This is me actively trying to lose against this plot crucial character, and I keep winning accidentally every time, sometimes even perfecting him. Maybe this character, Amada, and how easy he is, is supposed to be a joke. A large reason, however, for this is that your character's damage output and defense stats are tied to your levels you gain from grinding in the overworld and through usual play. But this isn't even me excessively power leveling or grinding, this is me going through the game at a very normal pace. But when your character's statistics and levels determine the damage output in these duels, it destroys any sense that these fights have a designed level of difficulty. Now I know the creators of Suikoden 2, specifically Yoshitaka Murayama, has stated in an interview with the YouTube reviewer Resonant Arc, Personally, I wanted to make a relatively easy game that anyone could beat, and that became a driving force during development. Rather than making a complex game system, I wanted to capture people with a dramatic story. So yeah, Suikoden was intentionally made to be quite easy, with some boss fights having the occasional difficulty spike. This was a reaction to playing very difficult games growing up, such as Black Onyx, and not being able to even finish them. So he wanted Suikoden to be a very relaxing experience that didn't challenge the player too much, so that anyone can play and beat it. You can contrast this to the lead designer of Demon's Souls and the Dark Souls series, Hidetaka Miyazaki, and how the difficulty from his games comes from his desired experience and level of challenge. When asked about the difficulty of Demon's Souls, for example, in this article by Game Informer, he says, Having the game be difficult was never the goal. What we set out to do was strictly to provide a sense of accomplishment. We understood that difficulty is just one way to offer an intense sense of accomplishment through forming strategies, overcoming obstacles, and discovering new things. Our goal of a sense of accomplishment was the basis of the game since the early stages of development, and we never strayed from that. It's interesting how it really comes down to the personal tastes of the creators of these games. So what about me? I think there's a lot of potential in the dual system of Suikoden, with a difficulty that is specifically tailored for it. It really reminds me of my very favorite boss fights in games, such as the Virgil fights on the hardest difficulty in Devil May Cry 3, the Roxas boss fight on the critical mode of Kingdom Hearts 2, and Pontiff Sullivan from Dark Souls 3 through a self-challenge run by only doing parries at a very low level. 
when you're fighting them, everything fades away. And you're just confronted with the game in a very raw form, like burning primordial magma. It's just you and the game at an almost physiological level, nothing else. And whether you can meet that challenge. The game asks, can you memorize boss patterns and react accordingly? Sometimes through parrying their attacks at extremely precise, frame-perfect timings. And if you don't, you're pretty much dead. This is my favorite type of gameplay experience, but I know this type of gameplay isn't for everyone. Actually, what I just described sounds exactly like Sekiro. For some weird reason, I couldn't get into Sekiro at the start, but after returning to it a year later, I think this game is so incredible and fun. Genichiro is an awesome rival character. Actually, recording all this footage was really really fun, holy crap. I want to keep practicing and make a video where I do perfect runs against these guys. Though, these guys are hard as hell, especially Virgil. I keep getting owned over and over. I'll do some more Shivering Hearts videos first though. I keep talking about other games, but that's just me letting my enthusiasm get out of control. But I suppose that's the fun of YouTube. Me sharing my love for these games and seeing if anyone else resonates with it. So, at the risk of sounding like an elitist scumbag, no, I'm not that bad. I think games are for everyone. But in my experience, the majority of people don't play games to be challenged. They want a smooth, steady feed of content that isn't very challenging or demands much from them, especially in terms of dexterity or reflexes, but still rewards them with these bursts of dopamine. If it gives them ways to creatively express themselves, then you got yourself a real banger. And that's fine. No judgement. Absolutely no judgement whatsoever. People can enjoy whatever they want. I like the occasional runescape session from time to time, you know? Catching swordfish at Karamja, combat training at Moss Giants, it's all fun. But through creating Shivering Hearts, it lets me pursue very specific forms of game design that I love and that I wish games explored more. I'm told by a few people that what I'm doing isn't very popular or won't get very popular, but eh, I don't really care. If sacrificing mainstream appeal means a lot less interest, but in return I can pursue game design that I really, really love, then I'll make that trade off in a heartbeat. Making these types of experiences is one of the best things in the entire world, even with the insane amount of work and stress involved. And as they say, you only live once. So you might as well pursue the things that you love. Now, obviously, this is all a matter of taste. And everything is subjective, especially game design. As the saying goes... How do you read this? <laughs> I'll try my best. De gustibus... <clears throat> De gustibus non est disputandum. Uh, a Latin phrase meaning, in matters of taste, there can be no disputes. Like the gameplay I prefer for sure isn't inherently better or have more intrinsic value or some nonsense like that, but I feel like I'm having a dialogue with the designers of these games during these moments. Like this is the level of challenge that the designers really envision. And I like what I like, and I'd like to channel that into my work if possible. So back to the dual system. Recreating these dual system at a much higher difficulty removes a lot of the physical and mental dexterity at learning these precise frame-perfect timings like the previous bosses I showed like Virgil or Roxas, but it still retains the mind games and the mental warfare along with the very harsh penalty for failure which creates for tense gameplay. I also think that having games that draw from gameplay systems that also work in the real world, like Rock Paper Scissors, forms a very solid foundation. I don't mean to sound extremely obvious, but Rock Paper Scissors is also the most perfectly designed game in terms of balance. Sure, they are the updates for Rock Paper Scissors, like this one here. Rock Paper Scissors Lizard Spock Spider-Man Batman Wizard Glock. Or this monstrosity here, RPS 101. But normal Rock Paper Scissors works so well. Rock Paper Scissors is the foundation for many combat systems, like the starter Pokemon in each generation of Pokemon, they form a rock paper scissors dynamic with fire, water and grass pokemon and then that expands to more pokemon types as you go further into the game. Or how the three races of Starcraft, the Zerg, Terran and Protoss, and how they are balanced. It's not like each race hard counters the other races, it's more like a specific army composition will counter specific strategies. 
Can a dual system carry a whole game? Possibly. Shadow of the Colossus is one of the greatest games of all time, and that's essentially a whole game designed around overcoming a series of boss battles, but those battles are contrasted against sessions of exploration, and like puzzle solving and scenery appreciation. So I won't know till I try, that's the short answer. I'll have to have people try it out, get feedback, and see where I could go from there. But I also think that having a party of adventurers is the foundation for any adventure. The original Dungeons and Dragons experience. It's not just a single protagonist, it's the group, and how they work off each other. So I do want to develop a more traditional JRPG turn-based combat system that involves the whole group, but I still really like the duel system, and if I focus on this first, then it really helps me start small, and then I could use the animations I developed and apply it to the overall combat system that includes the whole party. Now one example of a turn-based combat system that I really like is Final Fantasy X, specifically because it precisely shows the move order in battle, so you can really strategize around your party and the enemy's move order. I feel a lot of turn-based systems can really benefit from somehow showing this information to the player. Someone also recommended me The Legend of Dragoon on the PlayStation 1, where the strength of your attacks are determined by inputting buttons at very precise timings. Wow this game is good, just wow, extremely underrated. There is a plugin for RPG Maker MV that recreates the timed attack system from games like Legend of Dragoon. This system really reminds me of Lisa the Joyful, a DLC for Lisa the Painful RPG, with the character Buddy and her timed attacks, which I'm sure is a reference to Legend of Dragoon, or maybe it's a system that's quite common in JRPGs. Man, Lisa's good. I really love Lisa. If only Lisa the Joyful had a razor-sharp difficulty designed around nailing the really precise timings, but maybe that would have been too hard, and it's just a matter of my taste. I also mentioned before how Suikoden 2 also has a more traditional turn-based combat system where you're going to spend much, much more time in, which I also think has a lot of strengths. Having a six-party layout allows for more interesting party compositions, and placing party members in the front or the back row really has quite an impact on gameplay. Six characters is a great number to have, I feel. It's very comfy, adventuring with a party that size. Constantly issuing commands for six characters might get a little tedious, but I like it. Compare that to Baldur's Gate 2, which also has a six-party combat system but it's renowned for having one of the most complex and obtuse combat systems in gaming history, with reviewers of the game not even wanting to even bother to properly learn and acknowledge the nuances of the combat system, which I think it's quite a shame, especially since it's based on 2nd edition Dungeons & Dragons, which also has a bunch of really weird stuff by today's standards. I honestly think the combat system for Baldur's Gate 2 and how it interpreted 2nd edition D&D rules is one of the most incredible combat systems ever. That might sound a bit controversial, but that's because I guess I had the patience to learn it. And there's still a lot I don't know, it's a very deep game. I do admit it has a really huge learning curve and it's not one that the majority of players have the patience to stomach, even back in the day. I mean, this clip I'm showing isn't exactly an example of high-skilled Baldur's Gate 2 combat, but most of you won't even know. Ha ha ha. Suikoden's combat in comparison is so much more straightforward to conceptualize and learn its rules. It still maintains a great amount of complexity, but whether RPG Maker MV can support six characters is a whole other story. In fact, whether RPG Maker MV can support any of these systems I'm proposing is probably the biggest factor on what system I want to implement and how well I could execute it. I'm very, very lucky and grateful at how helpful the RPG Maker community is, like the plugins by Yanfly or the Suikoden Duels Combat by T-Wings, and it's the biggest strength at using RPG Maker as a game dev software. I'm open to learning how to code, and I have no issue at paying for gameplay systems through plugins or learning how to tweak code to have the game be the way that I want. I learned a lot of code back in the Game Maker Studio days. But as an example, I don't feel confident at pulling off satisfying real-time combat in RPG Maker MV like the Dot .hack series or Kingdom Hearts combat without seriously bending the functionality of RPG Maker MV. I think MV already has a ton of user-friendly functionality, especially with the tons of community resources and plugins developed over the years, and to really cooperate with the software, rather than forcing it to do something that it wasn't meant to do, unless absolutely necessary. Because otherwise, 
I might as well use a different game dev software if I want to achieve something outside of the scope of RPG Maker MV. So are there disadvantages with this system? Absolutely, for sure. Nothing's perfect. I doubt this will be fun to speedrun or maybe even to stream, as it can boil down to memorization and randomness, but I still think it's hella fun. Human memory is one of the most fragile things in existence, and making your fallible memory part of the fight can lead to very interesting scenarios. The combat would come down to interpreting each dialogue cue and read the opponent's mood and their moves rather than pure memorization. I also think while the duels are really fun, they can still be quite short, even if I raise the difficulty to extend the amount of time you spend during them. So maybe I do need to have other mechanics or develop a more traditional style of JRPG combat to carry a multi-hour experience and have the duels punctuate certain moments and serve as climaxes to the game. Now if you're interested more about Suikoden 2, I highly recommend playing it, or even watching the review by Resonant Arc, which I'll link in the description. Make sure to skip for spoilers, you know, I think you deserve that. <laughs> Every player deserves to not have an experience spoiled for them. His research into the game is incredible. I do want to pump out more of these types of videos, it's just a bit hard balancing this type of work on top of Shivering Hearts and applying for jobs, but I think I just need to be a bit less perfectionist and more casual about the process. It's still really fun, I really dig making YouTube videos over any other form of social media, and gathering all the footage and editing it and sharing my hot anime takes, you know, it's, it's super fun. Now that'll be me for this video, I will have to make this a two-parter in the next video regarding combat, I'll talk more about my ideas of implementing a group style of JRPG combat, but the next video would be me talking about the narrative of Shivering Hearts. So take care and see you next time, bye!